Welcome to the Friday seminar. Today we have um, Martin from the Department of Geography. So Martin is an assistant professor and director of the Center for Spatial Analysis. So um, thank you for coming, Martin, and looking forward to hear to what you have to say. All right. Thanks, Miguel. Well, welcome, everybody, to today's talk on individual decision-making in online participation, transportation planning, uh, where I recap some of my earlier work on, which basically was my dissertation research, but it's um, very um, relevant to, to this particular seminar and this audience. All right, just a quick acknowledgments. I was not in the lead. I was one of many researchers involved in this project. So I would like to acknowledge the principal investigators. It was a joint project uh, with the uh, University of Washington uh, under Tim Yerges and others, Piotr Jankowski at San Diego State, who was my advisor, and then Rhonda Young at the University of Wyoming, um, a collaboration between geographers, geoscientists, and engineers to create an online platform for public participation in transportation planning. And I come from an applied computer science background, so my take on the analysis of the interaction with our system is a little bit different than uh, maybe a, a traditional type of geographer. No, no, and nonetheless, I wear different hats, and I hope that's going to be apparent after the talk. Now, when we talk participation in general, we also have to acknowledge just as public, there's not one public, there's not one participation, and I like this illustration that is being brought in as a model for participation a lot of times. It's Arnstein's letter of participation. I like it because it's value laden with the assumption that the higher we go on this ladder, the more effort it takes, but the higher achievement we gain in terms of moving over decision making control to the citizens or to the lay persons involved in this um, in these endeavors. Now, it's a little bit tricky to strive for the high, highest rung because, you know, we are living in a representative type of democracy. We elect and we hire expert decision makers. So we will certainly end up somewhere in between. But how much uh, can we actually achieve facilitated by technology? Right? And when I say technology, in particular, when this technology becomes one that is supposed to foster decision-making, to inform decision-making. One approach to assess technology is through user satisfaction. Right? We basically ask, probe the users, the participants after the project has finished or so, what is it that you liked about the technology? But I would say that has certain implications for our assessment of performance because at the end, if we put all this money towards technology and decision-making systems, then it becomes worthwhile to look into how well did our system perform on a maybe revealed basis rather than a stated basis. You know, looking at user interaction and analyzing it and then uh, making some inferences about was it even good what we created other than, you know, users being satisfied. So what I would say, what informs this type of satisfaction, first off, it doesn't scale very well when the technology becomes complex. Usually complex technology is used in the context of complex decision-making processes. At least I would expect that there's a mapping between those two. And then also the outcomes of the decision-making process, how satisfied were you with the outcomes, will inform at the end, consciously or subconsciously, your assessment of the satisfaction of the technology itself. And again, if satisfaction is the only measure of performance, I think we are really looking at a situation where we can't disentangle or should at least strive to disentangle the implications of satisfaction with the decision-making process, with the technology, and the outcomes themselves. And that's where my interest comes in in terms of, you know, coming from an applied computer science background, being a GI scientist, but also a behavioral geographer, very much interested in individual decision-making. To illustrate this point a little, so let's say that technology is my Subaru Outback here, and I'm supposed to assess it driving on the German Autobahn in the middle of the night. You can actually use all the 150 horsepower or so. At that point, your satisfaction with the technology, because you got from A to B without any inferences, uh, interferences, as I mean, would probably be good. 
though if you know common situation in many highways you run into a lot of traffic uh, you're delayed then your satisfaction with the car might be informed by the dissatisfaction of the whole experience going from A to B and I try to unpack these different components in my work and that piggybacks a little bit on This illustration here by uh, Jaro Paturan and Zaheri, they are from a decision, spatial decision support background, uh, systems background, more the business school type of community, who came up with this illustration where I am most interested in how can we assess the fit of a technology to a particular task if both technology and task are complex. And I would say that's the most elusive component of any such analysis because at the end we can conceptualize task technology in the fit but usually it's approximated by you know how much was the system and how was the system used and through that we then infer good or bad performance at least that would be my approach as far as complex spatial decision support systems are concerned with that in mind uh, we created an online platform in this collaborative type of project and that goes back a uh, few years, quite a few years, 2007, uh, the website went online in the participatory geographic information system for transportation project with the collaborators that I showed you before. Um, and we created this website for structured analy analytical deliberative type of decision making of residents of the Puget Sound. Right? As an alternative modality to what we find a lot of times uh, direct votes on ballot measures, you know, how much money do you, are you willing to commit on these preconceived 10 or 15 projects that are going to cost you whatever, $200 a year for the next 10 years. And then, you know, you vote yes, no, a lot of times these falter because people were not necessarily broadly involved in participation in establishing these projects. So we try to come up with an alternative modality, start from the conceptualization not in a sandbox where everything is possible, but rather taking all these projects that were um, um, proposed in the past by decision-making experts and then offer them up for deliberation and uh, decision-making by a broad amount of people in the Puget Sound. So we're looking at a widespread type of distribution of these uh, projects um, in the Puget Sound. So we had to, about 230 registered participants and a very common uh, um, occurrence that you find in this realm of public participation is that of participant attrition. Right? So we started with 240 people. We ended up with 45 that had complete data points in terms of all the surveys that they answered, completing the whole decision-making process. And that one was fairly complex. The website is still online. If you want to log in, you can look at it. It's called letsimprovetransportation.org. Uh, is still hosted by the University of Washington. And when I say Puget Sound, you know, we should probably be quite familiar with what I'm talking about. We're really talking about uh, Snohomish, King, Pierce, and Kitsap counties around Seattle, the city of Seattle, um, and surrounding type of region. So why did we have such a stark attrition rate, basically? Well, it was a fairly involved type of commitment. It was a one-month structured process with sub-steps, five overall steps, a couple of sub-steps, and these themselves had certain activities that were either analytical or group deliberation, mostly based on online discussion forum type of formats. And uh, our participants, some of them were incentivized, they were paid by completing certain milestones, but quite a few were also there that basically didn't receive any kind of uh, monetary cons compensation. When I say that, that was not anything that was as significant as you might think, maybe $50, $60 or so for completing the one month type of commitment. And I was really interested in, you know, we theorized about the process, what it could be for a long time, implemented the software that would support the decision making process. And then I wanted to look into, based on all the individual level type of data that we collected, how does, map, how does that map back to um, the usage of our tools? So at the end, it became an effort to relate or associate these individual characteristics that we collected. Those were social demographics. Those were 
cognitive style indicators, which was a survey that basically tells you if you're more the analytical ty type, more the creative ki kind, or uh, the planner kind. All right? There's three different forms of decision making where if you load enough points into one of these questions and these factors, then you would be classified as one or the other. All right? And they supposedly have different traits in terms of preferences for decision making. We have travel behavior information, some spatial, some just uh, fairly common um, mode of commute type, primary mode of commute, times of um, how many times do you commute and things like that. But we also had in this context, in terms of making tools uh, accessible, not everybody is gonna be a computer expert. So we also had questions about you know, how familiar are you with online discussion forums, how familiar are you with these web-based type of platforms that we devised just to get a gauge on uh, what uh, the proficiency is of, of individuals. Now having said that, that category exposed least variability. So we had probably a little self-selection process happening where people already familiar with computers would gravitate to actually um, work with, with uh, such a platform. Right. But the question is, how do we relate user interaction? What does it even mean to look at user interaction and associate it with these individual characteristics that were fairly rich data points for these individuals? Okay, so here, again, uh, where my computer science background comes into play. At the end, what is interaction with a server based on your browser and the website, it is interaction with, with the server in the background that invokes the creation of web pages, of objects, invocation of functions, which then would be logged, just like probably your user interaction with Facebook is logged on all the components in the user interface, at a, at a level that is much more granular than just the exposed user interfaces uh, icons in, the, in others. So here we have in fact, a record for these 40-some people of about 40,000 logs that captured interaction of these finishers, I call them, so those participants that actually saw through the whole, whole process. Um, and uh, there were user identification information, timestamps, and at the end, I was not quite the person implementing the system, so it became a task of reverse engineering, the pattern pattern recognition in these server logs, mapping them back onto user-initiated or engaged activities, and then extracting some meaningful type of indicator of user interaction, right? So I can tell you, based on my knowledge here, we're looking at one person with different identifiers. So that person logged in, uh, went to the overview page, went to his, pro his or her profile page, went to a tool that I devised that allowed you to in input uh, travel routes, then went over to the uh, overview page again and engaged with some deliberation in terms of reading concerns and then basically posting his or her own concern, right? So within those, we see starts and stops of activities. And then the question was, how many activities can you really extract based on this reverse engineering type of endeavor um, out of these 40-some thousand? Now, one that is easily extracted in terms of interaction is total duration. It's just summing up all the indicators between start and stops, summing it up, and you have a numerical expression of how much every single person engaged with the system, which is you know, worthwhile, but it's not as granular as you maybe would want to look at. So I went back, what kind of activities can I actually extract from these patterns in these 40-some thousand type of logs? And I came up with this uh, different granularity. At the most granular level, we, we looked at, at about 25 activities, different activities that I could extract and identify within these patterns. And then the question also becomes, well, it's similar to using different spatial units of analysis. You go from census tracts to counties to the state level. What is the most appropriate scale for your analysis? Well, the same question can be asked about the granularity of your activities. Is it most appropriate to unpack analytical methods, analytical type of activities into context-based ones, or is it just okay to look at analytical as one type of activity, no matter in which context it does take place, right? So there were different granularities of this analysis, but mostly we're looking at analytical things, information gathering, and deliberation, right? 
So in terms of this cascading type of analysis, what becomes our uh, the representative variable basically in terms of user interaction, it becomes any of these markers in terms of engagement in these activities on different granularity levels which require the extraction of activities from the server logs, then a grouping ideally, because I wouldn't want necessarily to look at a single individual, I would, look, would look to want to look at individuals that have similar behavior or express similar interaction, and then relate it back to some kind of uh, characteristics that would allow us to label those, those groups uh, and relate them back to the uh, individual type of components. And I use clustering methods. Some of that work was published in uh, decision support systems where it's very much methodology driven, methods driven. How do you make sense of data like that? Um, and when I say clustering methods, we're basically looking at some tree-like representation of likeliness of user interaction. So here's an illustration. You have to think the numbers are basically people I have Alice and Bob in here. They're substitutes for little branches right now. And the idea is if Alice and Bob are really similar, then their distance along these branches where you can measure or express the dissimilarity basically in terms of making the branches longer or shorter, uh, then Alice and Bob would be clustered in a similar area. If Alice is very different from Bob, she would be on a different side on this, on this tree. Um, and that holds true for both of these different clustering methods that I use depending on what data I looked at. The granularity at the most granular activity information required a different clustering method than the total duration required. In fact, multiple sequence alignment analysis, if you have any kind of background in genetic uh, analysis, that's a method that is used to compare sequences of genes uh, in terms of evolutionary similarities. So what it codes is, in this case, traditionally the sequence of genes or genetic material, basically. In my case, it was the sequence of activities and also their duration packed into symbolic representations of, of sequences, basically. Okay? So ideally, these branches then that are clustered together would be such that you could say, I label them, this is, this is the crowd that mostly use analytical type of tools Maybe those also are those that map onto the cognitive style of analytical type of people. And then Alice would be maybe the more, uh, I'm sorry, Alice would be the analytical one, and then Bob would be the one that is more interested in information retrieval or some kind of um, information gathering type of activity. Or if we change our data for total duration, similarly you would expect those that spend a lot of time with the system to be clustered more closely together than those that spend average time or very little time with it. All right, so long story short, what came about, uh, they're not as surprising depending on how much variability you express in these sequences in particular that you know, are similar to genetic sequences, but rather, but in fact, activity sequences of which activities you engage with. Um, there's certain inherent issue the more time you spend and the more difference there is between total interaction, the longer or the shorter, comparatively speaking, the sequences of individuals become, it throws off the algorithm. So if one person has a really long sequence and another one has a really short one, that inherently throws off these algorithms. As you might imagine, if you're looking for evolutionary changes in this genetic type of sequences, those are small. You know, so thing here and thing there. So in this case, in that context, it works. Here it breaks a little bit down. Nonetheless, I suggested in this paper that um, it might not be the most purposeful in ours, but there are certain analytical synergies between these different clustering algorithms that are proposed in that if you have that sequence, here's an example of user 26 and 13. Basically, this number tells you, sorry, I should show this here. Um, this number tells you how many different activities a user engaged with, and these are codes of what it was. Uh, I think this is concern posting. Um, I had a coding mechanism that basically would express in three letter words what that activity is, right? And this one is only sequence, it doesn't incorporate um, duration. 
Nonetheless, if you have a sequence like that, and let's say your system was made to do that from the get-go, your complex system, and it captures user interaction in the sequences, then you have two things coded. You have the sequence of events and the duration of single activities. If you just unpack every single, you just count basically how many different three-letter words you have in there. If they stand for a minute of act uh, activity or five minutes, you sum them all up as a parsing type of activity of textual information, and you have your total duration as well encoded in that information. So I, I consider that a one-step approach to have multiple angles in terms of analysis of, of this data, of this data. Right. So once we had the classification with at the end, it, I had to resort to using total duration of activity as the most significant, in a way, most significant type of classification for this particular data and these particular participants. And then it was subjected to a regression analysis, a particular form, a logistic regression analysis, because at the end I was interested in what were some of the factors that would make you more likely or less likely compared to the average to engage with our tools in terms of total interaction duration, all right? So the baseline was the average group, and then we looked at significant associations being less likely or more likely than the average to engage with these tools. So groups, groups of users with similar user interaction became groups with similar overall interaction duration, and then we ran uh, the regression analysis and found very little association, actually. Sociodemographics didn't give it away. Cognitive style didn't make a difference. Travel behavior or such, which is unlikely to, I did not expect to have any kind of relationship, but you might just as well throw it into the analysis if you have that data, right? I wouldn't expect somebody driving a car to spend more time on the system, as long as there wasn't an inherent bias towards cars as a modality of transportation, maybe, then there might be a, some, some self-selection type of process kicking in. But if you found one for computer literacy, in particular those people that were had prior experience with online transportation discussion before, which was the form that we presented deliberation in this platform that we implemented in that platform. So you basically have the crowd that is interested or has prior experience with discussion forums, and those also invested significantly more time on average or compared to the average than others, right? So, so much for interaction, it's also about decision making. I say I, I wear multiple hats. This one was very much driven by concerns for performance evaluations that are not those that are stated by the users. Because again, for this, for this system, if you have, let's say, 50 tools, just like in a car, it's really hard to unpack your satisfaction with the fabric of the seat, the covering of the steering wheel, the design of the console, and the horsepower and the experience that you have in the cockpit. Similar here, it would not scale very well to ask users how satisfied are you with individual components of that system if that would require a 50 question survey or so, which you know, we usually attribute to or would refer to as survey fatigue. You know, it's a common, common thing and I, I would say uh, the more complex the task and the technology, the more tedious it becomes or impossible to unpack those two in a survey type of instrument. All right. So what about individual decision making? Part of the deliverable of this platform was, as I said, a alternative modality to creating transportation packages that would be proposed on a ballot measure, vote yes or no. Start early, have every individual come up with his or her preferred package that would be comprised of a pool of possible projects comprised of transit and road projects. And we also had them devise mechanisms that would create enough revenue from possibilities that range from taxes to tolls to come up with a revenue generating type of component. This, these are your 15 package, uh, projects in your package. You have these uh, revenue generating type of mechanisms they create. $200 million, you need 195, your package is good, right? That was a prerequisite. You had to combine not just a wild selection of projects, it also needs to be paid for with some reasonable measures. Again, this was not a sandbox type of approach. That was one mimicking 
and using methods and, and possibilities that were already considered, but maybe it didn't make it at the, at the end, ex excuse me, um, on a ballot measure. All right. So what about individual choices in terms of composition of individual packages, selection of packages? I engaged in a spatial analysis, fairly simple. Basically, I knew where the projects are. I knew what they were. I knew what the packages looked like for each of these individuals. And I had pretty good indicators of where people, what their activity spaces would be. At least pretty decent approximations. We knew through registration where they live. We knew, for the most part, where they worked, which you know, establishes a pretty good proxy for the connection between uh, two major anchor points in our life, work and home. And we also had a tool that I devised before you know, Google had any kind of opportunities to do mashups and stuff like that, uh, where you could input uh, start, stop, travel routes that were on your mind, uh, and those were saved as, as a brainstorming activity before people started going into talking about the concerns, right? Just to get them primed about what it is about the transportation system. They were expressing those if they so chose in these routes that they generated. So at best, at the least, I knew where they work and um, work, uh, live and work. At best, I knew where they also travel frequently beyond home and work. And a lot of times, you know, those roads that, uh, uh, routes that were generated a lot of times captured the commute or an approximation of a commute in terms of what uh, Google's routing algorithm would spit out in terms of connections between A and B. But, you know, a fairly decent approximation in terms of frequently traveled type of areas. So what did I do? I used distances, buffer distances that would capture projects of each individual around those routes and the points of interest with three buffers, 0 0.7, uh, 3.5, and 7 miles. And these, based on the literature, you could say these are conveni convenient walking, convenient bicycling, and convenient type of driving distances. You know, we could argue about is that a reasonable measure, but at least the important thing here is, again, it's a very exploratory type of analysis in, in that you say, I don't subscribe to just one. And I found pretty reasonable type of uh, evidence in the literature that, you know, that, that would map onto broadly what would could be conceived within walking distance, within bicycling distance, and within driving distance. Right? And that these distances around the routes and the points of interest were then related back to the composition of each individual package along two dimensions, basically. That's the, the idea here. Self-centered and selfless type of decision making. And I don't mean altruistic or egotistic. I mean where you are at the center of your decision making or maybe which we in fact strive for. Our concern in this public participatory type of project was spatial equity fair distribution of resources that, you know, you have the uh, cloud mine type of concept. People come, high type of concept, they come together and make something that is greater good or pr uh, provides a, um, contributes to the greater good, right? So I set out cynically in a way to look at how much is that though informed by taking a self-centered or selfless type of frame of reference when you were selecting your projects. So out of these 42, I believe, finishers, we had two where their composition of the packages had no relationship spatially to where they work, travel, or live, right? Two. Then we had another group of seven where it was a 60-40 split, 60% 60 of the project. And I think the average number of projects was 16. So about half of them were, had no relationship in, in terms of you know, up to seven and a half miles. The other 40% though did, mostly in terms of driving distance and bicycling distance. So most of their a fairly large number of, of their projects was within seven miles or so, within where they work, travel, uh, and live. And then the largest group, it flipped. 40% didn't have any spatial relationship, at least not that I could identify from the data that I had. 60 had, and in fact, the majority of those, if you split it up into a within walking, within bicycling and within driving distance, most of them were within walking distance, okay? So I, I would, within this framework of self-centered or selfless, clearly for the majority, 
and the selection of the projects, space mattered a lot in terms of selection your projects from all possible projects. If there was a self-selection process that there was a correspondence with proposed projects and where people live, that is hard to untangle. But certainly that was a fairly informed type of decision making that might be, again, conscious or subconscious, most likely conscious in terms of your selection of your projects. And I'm going to come back to that because, again, I don't want you to get away here and say uh, this is all egotistic type of uh, decision making or something like that. Cost analysis, the other component, where I'm just going to show you the numbers, what they said, and you can make up your mind yourself. Basically, we had two numbers, two markers. One said, how much is it going to cost you if you implement the projects that you want, and how much on average is going to cost everybody else, the public, the others, right? So it became a me versus you situation, which was always displayed as part of facilitating this selection process. And we basically look at a 200% difference, basically. You would pay half as much as everybody else to implement your project based on those projects that were selected, which in this case, you know, certainly speaks to a, a cost aversion type of gaming behavior in a way based on the participants that selected the projects, right? So at the end, I would say we are looking very much at self-centrism to be pre prevailing within the indicators that I had available to me within this project, right? That is both cost aversion, so you want to pay less, which to me speaks uh, as a form of self-centrism. Right? You, you are the reference point. You want to pay less compared to everybody else. And that might go over to something that is, in fact, a little bit imbued with egoistic or even egotistic type of decision-making. But, you know, I didn't go there. Uh, there's certainly a need for moderation. For instance, any information about how much time you spend, and that might differ widely between the people and the commitment to this one-month type of project, was never exposed. Nobody ever knew, other than me researching and digging through the data, how much everybody spent. And that might be quite informative to just inform other participants about, you know, I don't have the 25 hours or so that you spend to put it into a kind of context for them to assess their own participation. But it's also about these observed patterns infusing these findings into the decision-making process as a feedback loop, basically. Hey, this is what we found. You are choosing your projects so that you pay 50% less, half as much as everybody else. Might be an interesting thing to discuss by everybody if that is a common pattern. Right, just exposing it and deliberating upon it might be worthwhile. But here's the caveat in a way, because at the end, our, our system was meant to facilitate fairly complex decision making that is usually reserved to experts in their deliberation, selecting transportation projects and funding mechanisms, talking about them. So at the end, let's just say we weren't necessarily that successful with mitigating that complexity because at the end, what is your fallback plan for any such decision making if it's too complex? Where you work, where you travel, where you live, or those that you know or that are closest to you likely will inform something in, in terms of your decision making, just like it does every day, also as it would in a, in a software like that. So complexity might have been too large, not as facilitated as we wanted to achieve maybe something that would speak to um, the equal distribution of resources or the fair, equitable type of distribution of resources. So to conclude this, I would, you know, I argued that the system and the technology should be distinguished as much as possible from the outcomes, should be distinguished from the process. Um, this work was a partially an exercise in human computer interaction beyond just the stated performance measure. A lot of times, in fact, in human computer interaction, we'll find how fast are you, how efficient do you complete a particular task. But here, you're not talking about, you know, navigating a website and finding a particular link or something like that. We're talking about a complex decision-making process where it would be difficult to map any of these metrics of any particular activity uh, onto any type of interesting, maybe, or insightful um, 
measures of more complex human computer interaction with, in particular, this complex decision making tool. I tried, engaged in profiling in a way. I profiled user behavior so that I understand more about participation, but I also uh, understand more about the public, basically, or the participants that chose to engage in our project. Uh, and it certainly has raised questions in terms of, you know, if we all take a self-centered type of frame of reference, will we then just by coincidence allow for spatial equity? Or do we accept that if we all apply the self-centered type of decision-making framework, what means spatial equity in that type of context, right? If everybody is represented and everybody has access, maybe that's not a problem, but clearly just by computer literacy and familiarity, we already had a self-selection process happening uh, that excluded some and included others. Right? So if I had to identify the biohazards of public participation, in particular in this world of interconnected devices and people, very individualistic, I would say that representation of who's represented in these processes and what is represented in these processes is something that really needs to uh, tackled from different different type of perspectives. Who has access just by opening it up from town hall meetings onto online platforms? Certainly, we allow for greater access. That's what I assume. But is that just an amplified signal, an amplification of the same composition of people that would show up in a town hall versus using online type of platforms? That is that is not uh, necessarily clear. And then, how do we fight attrition? You know, how do we start with 240 people and end up with 40? How do we engage them? And at the end, you know, if this is about entertainment a little or just exposing some element of fun or reward that might do it for some to incentivize less attrition or at least not to the extent that you will find. But this 20% usage rate, in fact, uh, the, the people that basically sustain out of the people that, that we had uh, registered is fairly common. If you look at business information systems or stuff like that, how many people do contribute to online discussions and everything, you will find that many people registered lurkers, lurking basically, and then uh, only few contributing. So 20% is not unexpected for any kind of complex type of tool, in particular online. All right. So my take home message here is, for me, the public, and there's many words for it, stakeholders, participants, and such, I am a behavioral geographer. I am really interested in unpacking individual motivations, beliefs, values, uh, drivers of what makes you tick in a way. Uh, and that bridges closely or interfaces closely with working psychology, experimentation, learning about how we compute uh, and how technology mediates that type of computation in our brains, right? A lot of which is, as we see these days, emotional, uh, and maybe not necessarily as we wish, as rational. And participation itself being, my mathematical expression here is, a function of the opportunities for participation. So just because I hand you a hammer doesn't mean that you're gonna go and put a nail in the wall just like me providing this route mapping tool that I program doesn't mean you're going to go and use it. Doesn't mean that you're going to find it useful. So at the end, we have to acknowledge that the structured decision making process needs to be analyzed. The tools need to be analyzed. And as much as separation as possible there is, and the more individual understanding we have of individual decision making, the more we can tailor these decision making tools to individuals, right? And that is basically my, I'm an advocate for individual centered type of approaches to any kind of design, uh, in particular for public participation. And that is not just the technology that is, um, you know, reaching out to communities, bringing people in, uh, training people in all kinds of things that can be looked at. And then I will conclude at the 40 minute mark with a uh, short pitch uh, for the center that I'm directing, the Center for Spatial Analysis and Research. So we do run projects, spatial analysis, mapping type of projects with different collaborators and partners, but we also have, or I'm starting to 
uh, roll out um, a, a, some research agenda around um, individual engagement with virtual environments, virtual technologies. Again, looking at how does the exposure to uh, virtual environments and virtual technologies with the capabilities in forms, in this case, not decision making per se, but emotional response in terms of, you know, relaxation um, and, and excitement, really. Because that is really in the hand, as many transportation data collection methods, is in the hand of the industry. They are really good at collecting data about travel behavior. Same holds true for excitement and uh, good feelings, basically, about these, uh, about, uh, about these technologies. And not much is being done in, in academia uh, in terms of, you know, not losing our positionality in regard to, you know, contributing to this realm of knowledge as well. All right. With that, I will conclude. Thank you for your attention. And I'm happy to take your questions. Since you only had such a small fragment of the population yeah. able to actually have the access and the time to do these kind of like pretty detailed surveys, right. wouldn't you have to have everybody involved in order to make like really logical decisions about what uh, investment should go in? Well, you know, it's, it's kind of tricky, in fact, because there's a backstory in terms of what we wanted to, what kind of number we envisioned, because we didn't necessarily want to cap our registration numbers, but I can tell you there was a legal uh, recommendation at the University of Washington because we were closely in time to, so federally funded type of project, right, was close in time to a local ballot measure in the area around transportation projects, so the legal department said we should cap the number of people participating because otherwise one could see that as an engagement in uh, election voting related type of um, changes maybe, inducing changes in terms of you know, kind of using federal money to change things around uh, democratic processes basically. So they kept our number at 300. So we envisioned having thousands maybe because our system could have scaled to that. But in this case, you know, we scaled it back to 300 and then, you know, we basically remained with uh, the 40 some. So it's certainly a case study, but nonetheless, in terms of the insights gained or so, it will probably be different for the population here, or it might be. Have a much broader, like, like you said, there's no differences. Yeah, there's no choices and no differences. The only choice, the only thing that brought people together was also it was more varied. So nobody had any like socioeconomic things in common, or they had. All no, they were. were it was fairly diverse. You know, we had like the students, uh, low income. We had, you know, the, some of the public, some decision-making experts in the transportation realm. I just said that the variability in terms of the, the composition of the finishes was the least. They were very alike in terms of being really high proficiency in terms of one of the top two uh, classes, basically, of the proficiency scale that we had. The other ones were fairly, fairly distributed. I don't have the numbers here, but it was, it was geographically sampled in, in a way so that we had... Uh, representation from the different counties where the, the projects would be involved in uh, at, but at the end we didn't um, certify in any other way we didn't say that you know, we just have too much too many rich people also participating or too many students or so. Oh, uh, Richard. Uh, I, I had a question about like, you had that me versus you yeah. on, the, on the money and stuff. Right. I was curious about how that was presented to the people taking the surveys. I mean, is it like, you're going to pay this much in a dollar amount, or is it yes. going to be, a, oh, what? Well, yeah, so it was basically dynamically updated, because we assume that it's facilitating the decision, the selection. This is the number that would it cost you. That's the number for everybody else. And it was a very, very prominent part of the user interface. Uh, influence over just presenting it as this would be, a, you know, like a, uh, a tax versus, you know, uh, a toll, toll, yeah. It uh, difference how? Select for it. I mean, because you say you're going to pay more or less, people are always going to say I'm going to pay less. Is the way I would kind of. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least as much as everybody else would be good. Yeah. Right, yeah. 
I was just, yeah, I was just kind of curious about yeah, that. Yeah, I, I, I don't remember how it was in terms of pre general preference, you know, taxes over, over uh, tolls or so. Um, but, but clearly, just with this mechanism, again, we you know, theorized much about this decision-making process. And part of facilitating the selection was, or, you know, the, um, requiring was that, you know, you would have these revenue-generating type of mechanisms to pay for it. And, yeah, this is a lesson after learning and looking at the data, basically, how other ways, what other ways would we have to communicate that information so that it's maybe not then how best to redistribute the costs among me and everybody else. But again, this is, you know, it's always good to say you can theorize as much as you want about these technologies and these processes, and you only learn really after, after analyzing. for the website or what the team did, was it predetermined sort of what content would facilitate decision making for different types of decision makers so you could help direct those participants to those areas? As a classification among the participants and then kind of curating different user interfaces and information content to them? No, we had like one approach fits all basically um, and Everything that allows me to distinguish between the participants was just tabular data that was collected, but that did not influence the, the structure of the process or of this, uh, the platform itself. Could you say this page is, like, would be more um, tailored to a particular user group, even if all users went through that page? Yeah, the, the only distinction that we made was administration and, and user. So you would see other elements as the admin, basically, on that side to actually fill some information, but we didn't have any other, other way. Again, it was this, you know, more homogeneous approach to participants and everybody involved. And the deliberation, in fact, was based on kind of a Habermasian type of tradition of consensus finding. In that case, it was not so much emphasizing difference, it was all, you know, one, again, one, one system fits all, really. Individual, tailored kind of interaction. <laughs> so would you approach this differently based on that paper? I, I think we would, yes. Uh, and there are some follow-up projects uh, that came in different contexts out of the uh, University of Washington, and they used this platform. Uh, but it could also be then that you flip it around and you select your participants differently rather than from a wide distribution geographically and uh, demographically you might then um, concern yourself with a particular subgroup of decision making experts for instance or so. It's not said that you shouldn't be facilitating that decision making um, over, over you know, the public. Uh, Alexis Biddle. Uh, I'm just curious if you had the, the opportunity to look at the attrition, uh, look, looking at the log files that you had, if you were able to tell at what points people were. Yeah, when they dropped off. Yeah, there, there, there's some papers uh, from my colleagues out there at University of Washington, uh, Robert Aguirre and uh, Tim Nayerges. I think they have a, an annals of the Association of American Geographers paper that I think talks about that. They had a visualization tool called Grapevine that told, showed you how much participation there was for any particular sub-step. And it looked like a grapevine uh, visually. So that's out there. And I am right now after, you know, I'm not sure how many of you have worked on dissertation research, but it takes a while to rekindle uh, your excitement with the data itself. But I came back finally to look at attrition because it's something where, you know, how do we mitigate it? And is there, what, what difference do we find in terms of, you know, the composition of the finishers versus those that left the project before finishing? So that is really interesting. Who did not finish? And I'm just now getting into that to, to look into, you know, grabbing it out of the database and uh, combining it so that I can run some, some decent, rigorous type of comparison. What kind of uh, what kind of, uh, how technical was, would you say the content presented to users was that helped them make their decisions? 
technical in terms of just information of projects and what they do and things like that? I'm basically I'm wondering about the accessibility of the information format to lay people. I think it was it, it was all such that you know it, it basically was formatted for at that point for desktop consumption through a web browser, uh, very static, didn't require any particular knowledge other than familiar, familiarity with uh, structures of other websites, basically. So it, it wasn't quite innovative or progressive in terms of the information uh, provisions, basically. Um, having said that, there was always deliberation about that, you know, explanations about what certain steps do, what certain tools do. Uh, and that was part of the process, which were part of these sub-steps that I didn't outline. Uh, thank you, very interesting. So I have a question about, maybe you had time to look at um, one, how much time people have spent in the kind of selection process with the trade-offs in terms of the overall time they, you know, they were participating. The other thing is, did you have time to look at how people kind of make decisions, for example, one person can say, well, I want this project, and then I'm going to find as much money so that this project, you know, can happen. How oh, the package evolved, basically? Yeah, for example, everyone said, well, I want this. So I'm just going to choose projects based on the yeah. budget. So is, is there any kind of... I have to think about if that could be teased out of the server logs. I believe no. That is, I know that you created your park package and then I could look at the composition of it, but there was no logging of, uh, you know, insertion or deletion and timestamps of that. So that granularity we didn't, didn't achieve. But again, that, that would be something where, you know, if your data collection is interested in that, then you would implement it from the get-go, including those representations of interaction that I proposed in, in some of these clustering methods to you know, have it from the get-go rather than me going back, finding patterns, and then generating representations of those. How much time people spend with this kind of, in terms of the trading up uh, things? So is it 10% of the time? I, I don't know. Uh, I, I mean, all of this is, doesn't lend itself to very quick and dirty ex exploratory type of insights. I mean, all of it's, it's all basically encapsulated in, in this many, many relational type of tables. So it, I, I could look into that, but attrition I can certainly get because I know they have finished or not. And then these more nuanced ones, yeah, would certainly be interesting because then it would inform, again, also this, this paradigm of selfless or self-centered potentially uh, to have different indicators. But for this, for this scope, I basically focused on, on the, the things that were a little bit more readily available uh, and the server logs, again, they were in no shape or form accessible in the beginning to be analyzed. Um, it took a lot of data processing, basically, to get to that point. Yeah. Just let me see if I understood it right. Sure. The, the, the options that the people, the, the surveys had to options, were real options that were later on the ballot, right? Um, a subset was on the ballot. So we had, let's say, over, I'm not, uh, I don't remember exactly what the time frame was of, but they were, they were pro at some point proposed projects that were considered. So they were basically already funneled through an uh, expert decision making type of process, more like top down. That's what I said, you know, not really sandbox. It's not that we engage with all possibilities that are thinkable or even unthinkable, but we rather already used a uh, kind of more top-down mimicking type of approach. And I had particular reasons. The reason was that, you know, we wanted to achieve some comparability to already established planning type of processes. And if you arguably, people argue differently. If you start from the root and go up, then you could get anything. If you go top-down, then at least you confine. And that could be seen as a drawback, but, you know, in, in a way we subscribe to this to lend ourselves more to, hey, this is what you already generate, and we did. Um, uh, can you compare the results that you got in the software with the ballot results? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I have to say I don't know. 
because uh, I, I cannot recall what the composition of the of the ballot was. But you could, yeah. Why wouldn't you? Uh, I just, you know, it was a you know, few years back. Uh, so yes, you could certainly do that um, because at the end it's. Likely not that the, the likely that the ballot was comprised of those again the same pool. It's just a different composition, and maybe different variations and variants of, of the same project. So in this case, yeah. And I think that some of my colleagues actually worked on on, on uh, part of that. All right. It might it might be interesting in the future to see um, if you could measure just how poten highly potentially impacted the responders thought that they were, maybe that impacted the way that they responded with the tool? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I agree. There are a, a few online audience ask you a question about how do you recruit the participants? Yeah, those were broad type of recruitment process, uh, flyers on campus, uh, different campuses, uh, newspaper type of announcements. So, and then we had this uh, quota type of system where we did uh, try to guarantee a certain number proportional representation of different counties. So it wasn't just that we had all people from King County or something like that. So there was a quota system in place. But the quota system was made mostly to uh, warrant minimal representation and also to distinguish those participants that would be eligible for you know, a payment and those that would go beyond really the resources that we maybe had available and that we set aside for uh, research participants. Yeah. 